So welcome back to the Ice Ice Baby Ice Image of the Month uh, for May. Again, our goal with the Ice Image of the Month is to take advanced ice imaging and apply it and disseminate for all. Um, we are very, very honored to have Dr. Ashkan Adai joining us from Cedar sinai Welcome. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for inviting me to such a great series on Heart Rhythm TV. Yeah, and so, you know, we, you know, our, the case we're going to discuss today is that of a, um, uh, or a series of papillary muscle PVCs, and then also kind of how ice makes ablation of these arrhythmias better and safer. Um, so I'm going to queue up our video to get started here. So I think one of the, you know, the, the, the great first questions is, you know, when do you decide to do a transeptal access versus a retroaortic approach uh, for different PVCs originating from the papillary apparatus? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think you'll see a variety of approaches from different operators. Honestly, it depends on what you're used to, what you're comfortable with. I think both approaches, you can approach both papillary muscles. Um, I think there's some advantages, for example, to the, to the transeptal approach for the anterior lateral papillary muscle. In some cases where the anterior lateral pap muscle is taking off relatively anterior and take off on the base more basal, you may have difficulty coming from a retrograde approach and also reach in a dilated ventricle. So I prefer the transeptal approach to the anterolateral pap muscle, but I use both, I mean, but I use the, the transeptal puncture for both actually in my, in my routine practice. So that's your, your first default is to go transeptal first. Yeah, I usually do that just because I'm very comfortable with transeptal approach to the LV. Uh, I do most of my VT ablations, endocardial LV VT ablations with the transeptal approach. And that's just my operator preference. Some people are different they may use retrograde more so for the LV. And it, it's all about comfort level. Yeah, no, I think it also depends on how you're trained. I mean, you know, I was trained to go retroiotic first and then transeptal, right. uh, depending on reach, but you know, really to employ both. Um, I think I'm, I'm gonna actually draw our attention to the image now, because this image that you sent me, it shows, you know, your transeptal approach and the, uh, the catheter coming from the mitral, uh, through the mitral valve towards the, anterolateral papillary muscle. I find that, you know, the transeptal approach kind of gives you, uh, you know, good reach uh, laterally and also kind of gives you a lower um, approach to the anterolateral papillary muscle. So, um, but, you know, kind of, um, do you find that it always works for that? Or say there's a, sup a, a PVC originating from the superior aspect, do you find that it works as well for that too? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, the most importantly, when you do the transeptal approach is you're exclusively using a deflectible sheath. I don't think that uh, without a deflectible sheath, it's very uh, easy to uh, navigate the papillary muscle, both pap uh, posterior medial and anterior lateral. So the deflectible sheath um, with a deflectible catheter, you're able to get to the superior portion, the extreme lateral portion, which may be difficult even from a retroaortic approach to get to the lateral base right next to the free wall of the LV. Mm -hmm. um, and then interior tip, body, all those things can be approachable in that sense. And so I think the first couple images here are your transeptals and then, mm -hmm. um, and then we go to the retroaortic also yeah. showing, um, this is an example of the anterior lateral access from the retroaortic coming from superior right. with a high density mapping catheter. Do you use high density uh, mapping catheters for your papillary PVCs? Yeah, on occasion I do, um, but my focus I think is really, uh, you know, the ablation catheter manipulation on ice, because I think that's gonna be the end all with your ablation to get to the right spot. So sometimes you may get to an area and you think you got great contact with the mapping catheter, but then you try to reach the same area with the ablation catheter. And it may be challenging. So I think having the ablation catheter mapping, doing all those things around this three dimensional structure I probably use that first with ice rather than just breaking out the mapping catheter most of the time. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. You know, the, the papillary muscle is a, it's, it's a three dimensional complex structure. And so that's not fully captured on your electrotonic map. So I think ice imaging to help you navigate your catheter around cordae and all these different things really, really enhances 
the imaging of the papillary muscles. Um, I, I think that you brought up another really good point, which is deflectible sheath through the transeptal. I think there's no other way to do it. Right. Do you use a, um, a, 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 a mapping visible sheath or do you use the Agilis or what sheath do you use? Yeah, my go-to is an Agilis, probably medium curve uh, to large curve, depending on the chamber. Um, and again, you can visualize the sheath to a degree on the ice catheter, but I, I generally don't use a lot of sheaths that are visible for the three-dimensional mapping system. Um, I think it's worthwhile doing if you want to go completely floorless, for example, that may be uh, useful in that sense, but I generally don't use those, those types of sheets. Okay. So I think, uh, you, know, we'll, you know, we'll move on to our next topic here, which is, first off, this is such a money video that you have here, but it's really just kind of an overview, moving the catheter, um, you know, the ice catheter through the papillary muscles and understanding that in three dimensions. So I'm going to let you take it from here, but just kind of describe your video Absolutely. here. This is from our simulation lab where we can do simulations for uh, interventional procedures. When you get your ice catheter in the RVOT basically in front of the bundle with hiss, you're going to clockwise and see the septum first, and that's going to show up right now. And that's the septum. Now, based on anatomy, the next papillary muscle in front of you when you clock is going to be the posterior medial then you're going to hit the anterior lateral. And that's how you determine the difference, right? Is that I know by ice where I am based on where I was. So if I clockwise from the septum and I get to the papillary muscle, I know the first papillary muscle is going to be the posterior medial. Then I clockwise even more to get to the anterior lateral. And that's how I know the difference. And again, you can overshoot and come back with counterclockwise and kind of understand the three dimensions of each in that sense. And your go-to imaging, it sounds like, of, of the papillary muscles is to put the catheter into the RBOT and, and not to necessarily put it in the apex. I know some people do that too, right? Yeah, I, I think apical position is difficult. Sometimes you get a lot of ectopy and you may fight the septal papillary muscle in the modern root vein complex. Um, and so I use, yeah, exclusively in the RBOT, you know, uh, around the you know, bundle of this in the front and then try to manipulate to the point where I can see kind of the septal aspect of the posterior medial, the lateral aspect of the posterior medial, then move on to the anterior lateral septal aspect and or the medial aspect and the lateral aspect. So just trying to delineate all parts of each one. Yeah, and this is a nice image you sent me also of getting them both at the same time. Um, right. I, I guess getting a slice of the posterior medial as well as a majority anterior lateral. I think this is also an image from the RBOT, right? Yeah, this is from the RBOT, and um, you can see it's, uh, you know, it's right next to the septum and uh, the high RBOT. And again, you're going to look at pap muscles and see a lot of variant anatomy between patients. So this is a great way to look at the anatomy, and all pap muscles are created differently. Different heads, accessory pap muscles, all these things matter when it comes, when it comes to ablation. Um, I, I'm going to rewind this just a little bit to talk a little bit about... Um catheter stability and kind of how you know ice helps us with that and i think this this is the example that from the from the retroaortic approach and i think you also have another one which I'll, I'll show in a second but you know often i find that you know more times than i care that the the pvc originates from the tip you know and uh, right. with a contact force catheter trying to get contact force it, you can very easily slide and eat off, off the tip in either direction. And so ice kind of uh, verifying the contact is very helpful. Kind of, you know, with stability issues on the pap muscle, what tricks or tips do you have for kind of using ice to improve that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that's probably one of the most important thing when it comes to pap muscle arrhythmias. You have a dynamic structure, you often have ectopy, and that throws you off as well. Um, my approach is to look at the pap muscle from different angles of attack. So if you look at the tip, for example, and you're trying to go head on on the tip and you're having difficulty, it may be worthwhile to go overshoot the tip and bring the catheter back and try to get some contact while you pull back. And again, it may not be perfect, but at least you have a little better contact than you did before. And you may not get high you know, contact for force grams, 
but really you're using ice to ensure stability. And you can get a good lesion, even though you don't have a very extremely high contact force. Um, and that, that's kind of my approach. And if I need to come from the medial side or the lateral side of the tip, I try to do that as well. Uh, so treating it really like a three-dimensional structure. Now that's, uh, that's, really, that's really excellent. Um, and then you also sent me a really cool image here of you kind of circum circumferentially uh, go around the papillary muscle. I'm going to play that in a second, but is, is this a, are you doing a papillary muscle isolation here or just kind of showing the different views and, and, and the different areas you can ablate? Yeah, this is kind of my process when I ablate these, uh, these structures is that um, I do try to triangulate to a degree okay. the area of interest. And if I get a early signal and I ablate PVCs disappear, that's great, but I'm not gonna stay in that same exact spot. I may wanna triangulate a little bit around that area, whether it's the body, the tip, or the base. And this is actually a PVC that was uh, in, in good frequency in the beginning of the case, but then kind of disappeared during the mapping phase. So I got a little bit of mapping, and then we decided at that time to really triangulate around the body and the base. And so this is ice at its best, where it shows you one where your catheter is in the posterior aspect of the base, delivering a lesion with high, you know, good quality, good contact and stability. There's edema on the pat muscle body. That's number number two. And then the series of images show that the, the catheter moves a little bit more medial on the body and then comes around to the anterior part of the body and delivers, uh, you know, radio frequency energy there. And that's really triangulating the area. Um, Again, we had not a great endpoint. We couldn't induce PVCs at the end, but that didn't mean anything, but the patient got a great result. Uh, and I think it, it highlights one of the most important things about PVCs from the pap muscle. You may have to do multiple lesions. There's multiple exit sites. You may have to get good contact from every aspect, every angle. And in fact, there's a lot of studies showing that most people are, are doing you know, uh, lesions number, number 12, number 10, just to get uh, a durable uh, effect. So I think that's something that I try to uh, do every time I, I um, ablate a pat muscle PVC, triangulate and not stay in the same area. So that's a really good point. I think, you know, papillary muscles, right, they're three-dimensional, they're complex, and, you know, say it comes from deep in the pap, you know, you come at it from one angle, what you don't realize, unless you're looking with ice, is that you can get the catheter on the other side. Exactly. And, and treat it deep lesion uh, from the from another angle. Maybe you get a different force vector, et cetera. Exactly. So I agree. I think that you know papillary muscles can be uh, challenging uh, and interesting, but at the same time, I think that uh, frustrating. So Absolutely. what you'll need to do is come at it from multiple angles. And ice, I think, is really the tool to do that. I, I can't imagine doing it without ice. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, you commented a little more also about watching your lesions on ice. This is something that we talked about in our last episode, and I think it's important to kind of hammer this point home. But will you comment on how you use ice to, to uh, guide your lesion delivery? Yeah, I think in addition to stability, um, sometimes you do see edema. And again, you're, you may be delivering moderate power for long duration, which is somewhat kind of the standard that I, my approach is for these types of PVCs. But if you see a lot of edema, we always kind of, you know, EPs walk the fine line between um, you know, RF current complications. And some people like the edema because it shows a deep lesion. Uh, some people don't like it. But if I see a lot of edema, then I may back off a little bit on titrating the power and then again, approach it from a different side um, in general. So I do use it mainly for stability. I look for lesions, but if I see a lot of edema, I may just back off slightly and then come to the other side to finish off a, a lesion set. Um, I don't believe that there's any significant complications from doing this type of you know, PPC ablation, triangulating and everything. And I think there's a study out there showing that it's pretty safe. It doesn't have any mechanical effects on mitral regurgitation, et cetera. So um, kind of in the same vein of talking about papillary muscles and how they can be challenging um, from, for a number of reasons to ablate. Yeah. I think we'll, you know, I'd like to take the conversation in the direction of kind of 
some of these more advanced uh, or kind of uh, off the beaten path uh, techniques such as bipolar ablation or uh, using half normal, normal saline irrigation. So, uh, and I'm gonna play the video here of, of, of an example with the anterolateral papillary muscle, um, you know, with the catheter one retroaortic and one transeptal treating a deep uh, anterolateral papillary muscle uh, PVC um, and then watching the lesion form on ice. But at the same time, I want you to comment for when do you employ some of these techniques as well, too? Yeah, I, I don't think I employed often during the de novo case. Um, usually using multiple lesions, good contact, you know, triangulating, using all the techniques that you have. I think we've, you know, established a good acute success rate. Um, for redos, I think you may have to consider that especially at the base, which I think this shows, this is the base of the anterolateral pap muscle where you may have to deliver a deep lesion, long, high power, long duration. Um, so we employ bipolar uh, ablation techniques and, and routine practice for, for deep septal or uh, you know, deep uh, tissue um, lesions. And I think it would, near, it would be nearly impossible to do that in this setting without ice uh, to, to be able to have the right distance, contact, stability. Um, the other possibility is to use a, a technique to lower the systemic impedance. So we use that frequently in our practice where uh, if there's a high systemic impedance, we'll change the patch location or add another patch to be able to deliver more current uh, in that setting. But I think this is a phenomenal image um, to show that bipolar ablation can be applied to the, to the base of the pat muscle and be effective. I think the term that's used is chopsticks. Um, and this was a redo. And um, at the same time, um, so I want to, you know, say say you're say you're doing a redo, okay? And it's you know it's a challenging uh, case that has recurred, unfortunately. Um, what do not you read for first? Uh, you don't have redos. <laughs> <laughs> no, not uncommon, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so what do you reach for first? Um, half, you know, uh, changing the irrigation or, or, or bipolar ablation, or it all just depends on how it maps out. You know, I think um, there's a point to taking the time to remap, for example. So don't just assume that you're going back to the same area and you just have to give more power. There are some exit site, site changes that could happen. And you may have a little variance in the, in the exit site of the pat muscle. And so take that into account, do the mapping, right? Um, and you may see that you may have a totally different by a centimeter or more of an exit site possible. And so that is very important. If you get to the same area and you're looking at the same thing and you're still delivering lesions standard and you're not able to uh, you know, eliminate the PVC or you just wanna uh, give more power, then I think um, yeah, the, the approach to, to, to deliver more current, however it is, right? We'll take the bipolar system out. Um, we'll we'll uh, do the systemic impedance or half normal saline um, and try to give more current in that setting. But don't forget about mapping the basics before you go on to higher power. I think that's very important. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think, uh, you know, very, very nice discussion. Thank you so much. I think, so you, I know you have a role in the fellowship. So. I'll ask you to take us home by just saying, okay, so what is the kind of, what's your take home point about ice as applied to uh, papillary muscles? And uh, can I guess for fellows or early career or for anyone for that matter? Absolutely. I, I think ice is very important. Number one, I, I don't think that um, doing this without ice is, is putting you at a, at a disadvantage to a degree. When it comes to ice, know anatomy and understand everything has normals, variants, and use the vantage point to your advantage. So if you know you're gonna be in the RVOT, if you know anatomy, then you can understand the three-dimensional structure that you see in front of you. Um, so we don't have 3D ice, but 2D ice does, does a good job to, for your understanding and kind of in that, in that space. Well, uh, thank you very much. As we say, ice is truth and um, we appreciate your, your great commentary and uh, look forward to the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. Great discussion. Pleasure.